We welcome you to hear the words of the Lord today, or you can read them along in your Bible. We are reading from the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So, May so Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, in the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord for what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you uttered against God, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but it is against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for the Lord has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites Say to them at twilight, you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. Lord, it's, it's important right now for us just to stop and to pause at home. Sometimes when we're looking on devices, it can be tempting to do a lot of other things. But Lord, let us enter into this space of being fully present to you and to your word and to your direction. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's good to have you all with us. Today I'd like to use as a sermonic theme, I won't complain. I won't complain. Grumbling and gratitude as a subtitle. Remember good times when you were so happy you thought you would explode. When life felt good and you wanted to freeze that moment because it was so good. Like the day you walked out of Home Depot loaded with your DIY project and you saw those hot dogs and they looked so good. And a stranger noticed how you were eyeing those hot dogs and bought you one with only one expectation that you would enjoy it. 
or when you left home to go to college or to pursue your dreams and fell in love with your kindred spirit, your soulmate. And you guys have been riding high ever since. Or when you look at your child and you watch your child trying to imitate the other parent and you realize in that moment how much you love them both. Or the day that you came out to your family and you felt the freedom to be your authentic self. And it wasn't about how they responded to you, but the burden that you laid down. And it felt good. Or the time when you went to a conference and it was so boring, but you and your friend found something funny. And though you tried to suppress the laughter, the giggle forced itself out. In the Mennonite church, when someone gets married, they make a quilt for them. Every household, every community, every group in the church is given a patch to design it as they want. And then the quilters come together and they sew all these patches together. And so on the day of the newlyweds wedding, they present them with a covering of all of those who love and care for them to cover them in this life. See, good times come to all of us a time when it seems like our cup runneth over, when our head drifts off to sleep, even before it touches the pillow. I bet if you tried, you could find them too. Gratitude, blessings, light, hope, good times. And if you lingered in that moment, bet you'd be surprised how many good times would visit you. You might even remember when God parted the Red Sea. You see, the Israelites were freed from Pharaoh. You often can't appreciate freedom if you already have it. Seven years ago, Ariel Castro would kidnap Michelle Knight. And then a year later, not seven years ago, actually about 20 years ago, he kidnapped Michelle Knight. And then a year later, he kidnapped Amanda Berry. And then a year later, he kidnapped Georgina de Jesus. I don't know if you guys remember this, but these three girls he kept locked up for 10 years, living within blocks from where they had grown up. You see, he was the father of their friend, and that's how he lured them into the car. Day after day, they were exposed to all kinds of abuse, but 10 years passed, and there was an opportunity to break free. And one of them cried for help, and the neighbor next day banged the door down, they called 911, and three girls and a six-year-old girl were free. And I have to imagine what does freedom feel like for them? To be free from their torturer, to listen to men and women who have been in jail talk about freedom gives us a different perspective. To have a new life of freedom before you. For Michelle Knight, the first one abducted, she said at 32 years old, it was the first time she really felt that she was free. But now she was free, and the Israelites were free. They were giddy free. They were free from a corrupt leader, and they were happy, and they were so happy. And in chapter 14, we learn they're so happy. They're singing. They're happy, and it pours out of them into their music. And have you ever listened to people sing and be happy? They're singing, I will sing to the Lord, for the Lord has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider have been thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my might, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise God. I will praise God, and I will exalt God. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is worthy to be praised. They were singing, and they were so excited that they had been freed. They were now out of Egypt and free from their monstrous leader. Did you see what God did for the Israelite? Yes, God loves us. They are talking about God's continual love for God's people. We're really blessed to have a God like that. It's so good to be free from bondage. We're really blessed to have a God like that. It's so good to be free. This freedom is fresh, and they are happy. 
They continue to sing, and then Miriam grabs a tamarind. I know every Pentecostal can appreciate the rhythmic flow of the tamarind hitting Miriam's thigh. They are singing and beating tamarinds, and they're so elated to be out of the hands of the Egyptians. They are free. And then from chapter 14 to chapter 16, something changes and shifts and they began to complain. They were three days away from Egypt with no water and they began to complain. They were thrusted into uncertainty and they got to thinking and looking back and suddenly living in Egypt didn't look so bad. And they got to thinking, hey, we're out here in the middle of nowhere, we don't have no food, we don't have no water. What have you gotten us into, Moses? We should have never listened to you. We should have definitely never followed you. And they forgot all about what God had done for them. And they could see this wilderness right in front of them. There have been foggy days in Chicago where there's zero visibility right here at Lakeshore Drive. And you get out there and you can't see far. It was foggy spiritually for the Israelites and they couldn't, they couldn't see they couldn't see far and they got scared and they were hungry and they began to complain. It's not hard to complain. I mean, come on, keep it 100 real. It is not hard to complain. I mean, some days it feels like the world is not cooperating with us and we look over on someone's plate and their life looks better than ours or the bike we're pedaling is all uphill, or it's taking longer to get to where we want it to go than we expected. I mean, don't you complain? Don't you let some things fall out of your mouth? I mean, 2020 has been an all-time year for complaining. I mean, some have even said 2020 can go. We're ready for 2021. I mean, but don't we have the right to complain? Sometimes complaining can be a slippery slope. There was this YouTube video, and it's an ice hill in Norway, and it shows this guy. He's trying to get to the top of the hill, and every time it appears that he's almost at the top of the hill, he slides back down. Sometimes complaining can be a slippery slope that pulls us down. This summer, I went with another family strawberry picking. It was nothing I had done, but it sounded like a good idea to go strawberry picking. I mean, I was thinking of all the things we could do with the strawberries, but not just that. It was a family activity, and we're gonna get away from technology and spend quality time with our kids. And I hooked up with another family, and the thing about strawberry picking is, you have to kind of plan ahead. So we came up with a date that we're gonna take our kids, we're gonna go out here and spend quality time and we're gonna pick organic strawberries over in Indiana. The only thing was the day we pick happened to be the hottest day in the summer. No amount of water prepared us. And the thing about strawberry picking is it's not like there are shades, but there are rows and rows of strawberries and there is nothing at all between you and the sun. Two minutes in, sweat had broke free from my skin. It was pouring down my face. Five minutes in, the idea of picking strawberries as a family activity started to feel like a bad idea. 15 minutes in, the kids were complaining. It's so hot, I can't take it, I can't take it anymore. 20 minutes in, I saw the Mexican worker sitting on the truck taking a break, thinking about what life was like for them. 30 minutes in, I began to think of my ancestors in the cotton field. And I know what I was doing probably was no comparison, but I was feeling a little bit closer to my ancestors. 40 minutes in, they found me and picked me up and we all retreated to an air-conditioned car. 50 minutes, we were at the Dairy Queen buying ice cream sandwiches. <laughs> the temptation to complain is real and it pulls us all in. 
You mean to tell me God got the Israelites out of Egypt only to put them in the wilderness with no water and no food in the hot sun? Why would you bring us out of Egypt into the wilderness, Lord? Why are we here, Lord? What's the point? Haven't we suffered enough? What's on your mind, God? A slippery slope. I can imagine there were all kinds of thoughts going through the Israelites' mind. I imagine it felt like a cruel act about right then. Have you ever noticed what happens when one person yawns in a group? Watch it. Soon another person starts to yawn. It's almost like yawning is contagious. Complaining is like yawning. It's contagious. You can be minding your own business. You could think an event went well and somebody sits down beside you and start complaining. And suddenly by the end, you've joined in. In fact, professionals in church conflict will often tell you when you have a conflict, often it's not a conflict of the church, but usually it's one or two people. One or two people that have deposited a seed somewhere and involved others, and slowly you have a whole group of people complaining when really it was just that one or two people that had a gripe or that began the complaint. You have to be conscious not only about your complaining, but you have to be conscious about who you sit beside because sometimes somebody can infect you with complaining. The Israelites were struggling in the wilderness with the scarcity of food and water. In seminary some time back, we had a program where we would bring students from another country. Every year, a student would come and get to spend a year with us from a more developing country. And one year, a brother joined us from Kenya. And he said to me one day, you know, it took me a long time to understand what the word leftover meant. He said, I would hear people say this, but I, I had no idea what leftovers were. And then, he said, I was the guest at someone's home, and I saw all the food that came out. He said, in Kenya, there are never, never leftovers. In fact, we hope we can feed everybody the first time. You see, in some parts of the world, there are no seconds, there are no leftovers, and sometimes there are no firsts. In some parts of the world, this wilderness experience of scarcity of food and water is much more of a reality than here. In some places, people are starving. Imagine the Israelites in this moment of hunger and thirst. Imagine those even before COVID who had so very little. Imagine people in war-torn countries or in cartel countries where the vigilantes are the rule. Imagine running for your life and you make it out only to find yourself in another country that doesn't want you here. Imagine wondering where God is. Maybe you don't have to imagine, maybe that might even be you at times. We are in the wilderness today. I felt the same way on election day almost four years ago that I felt on Friday when I learned that Ruth Bader Ginsburg had transitioned. I believe that sister was trying to hold out and it felt like a setback. We have lost folks and COVID has taken the life of people. I was listening to a minister yesterday share that we have not properly grieved the loss of what is happening in our lives. We have members in quarantine and even this month, COVID has even come closer to United Church of High Park. We have had deaths upon deaths and there is grief. The religious right screams pro-life and yet we have not fully appreciated the life of those that we have lost in this last year or this last five months. We don't appreciate the life that hangs in the balance now. This is our chance to show how pro-life we are, how much we care about humans. So if you want to complain or you want to cry or you want to have a moment, I think it'd be all right. In the text today, God does not go off on the Israelites, but God meets them where they are. 
It's okay to acknowledge that we are in the wilderness because we are. I once had a cold and some charismatic Christian said, don't claim it. My nose is running, I'm sneezing, I have a headache. I'm not claiming anything, I got a cold. We are in the wilderness. So if you need to sit down, you need to cry, you need to catch your breath, you need to grieve, God will meet you there. So I encourage you to grieve if that's what you need to do. Complain if you need to do it. In fact, every once in a while, everybody should cry. It's just good. Let it out. If it's good for the earth, it's good for us. Today we grieve, but tomorrow, like the Israelites, we are challenged to trust God. I ordered food yesterday, and the receipt, the, on the receipt, the manager wrote the words gratitude. Gratitude is the art of appreciating what you are grateful for. You can do it infrequently, you can do it not so frequently, or you can do it all the time. You can make it a spiritual discipline, appreciating the things around you. It was a beautiful day yesterday. I stepped out of the restaurant with my food, with my receipt, with the words gratitude written on it, and two women were reading from their books they had written. And a few people were standing around listening to them. And then I saw Jet standing in the chase line, and I was so happy to see him, and we laughed. And I was talking on the phone to June about getting together today for pop-up pastor in Nichols Park. Hope that you guys come, if you want to. And people were walking dogs and riding bikes. And two people were engaged in conversation, eating outdoors. And I returned to my car and I held my puppy, Prince. And I let love run through my fingers. Birthdays and graduations and anniversaries are still being celebrated differently. We are making time for each other. Bike sales and dog sales have gone up astronomically this year. There is more communion happening with the earth and appreciation for outdoors. More Zoom calls are being made, and they're not all business, but people are meeting their families all over the world, getting together for family meetings. Family and friends have regular scheduled time together. Me and my friends get together. We complain some. No, we complain a lot. But people are making time for each other. And maybe we didn't get to do what we wanted to do, or we get, didn't get to fly to where we wanted to fly, but we still can be grateful that love not only found us, but love created us. In that short moment from the restaurant to the car, I could feel God's goodness intensely while feeling fall tickle my face, the coolness of the breeze in the air, God's been good to me. God's been good to you. God's been good to us. And, gratitu and gratitude says, slow up, slow up, Anika, slow up, Amy, slow up, Anthony. Slow up, Stanford, pause, because God has been good to us. One of my professors used to say, if I never, ever live another day, God has already been so good to me. God brought us out of a situation that was not good for us. Won't God do it? Won't God do it? God got us away from things that were limiting our capacity to soar. And God did it for me, and God did it for you, and God did it for us. God is the God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances, infinity. And God did part the Red Sea. And excuse me, put your finger over your ears, but God is badass for sure. God did some things for me and you that we couldn't do by ourselves. And right here in this moment, we are blessed. Therefore, we could complain, or maybe we won't complain as much, or maybe 
just maybe, maybe we won't complain at all. Amen.